Good morning and welcome to Hope Christian Church. at my heart again Look at the mess I've got in I'm learning to trust in you To know that you'll see me And through my pride and through my shame Into your love, into your grace I'm not looking back till I see your face I'm running straight to you all I really want to do is to fall into the emptiness that is a space in between us to break this division. All I really want to do is to fall into the emptiness that is a space in between us. Erase it and bring us together again. My life's a no. voice of truth. One day, we got to get them back up there again, the words. We're still doing the handouts for everybody? We really want you guys to sing along if you can. Um, everybody's wired different, you know, but this is a free place. You can stand up, you can clap, you can sit down and be silent and sing inside your soul, whatever you need right now. But what we're doing here, what we're really trying to do here is we're doing this for an audience of one that is our, our God, the one who created all of us and the one who redeemed us and saved us through Jesus Christ. So, it's not a concert, and you're all in the band. Even if you're just crying out from your soul, you know, it counts because he sees it and he hears all of it. Let's do it. Let's kick one in. Enough of my yakking. Kind of thing. 
faith it takes to come out of this boat I'm in. Under the crashing waves, to step out of my comfort zone into the realm of the unknown where Jesus is. And he's holding out his hand. The waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me. Praise God. Thank you so much, Sarah. I have so enjoyed Sarah's contributions to the music. I was telling the guys uh, when we run, we run rehearsal real quick in the morning to try to sort of polish the dust off and remember. Bart chose the songs this week and told me I'm singing this one, and I was like, 
sometimes I have a hard time getting through this one. This one hits right deep down in the deepest part of me. My brain will flash through scenes in my life, horrible, horrible scenes, and how I am not worthy to be called the Son of God, but I am. By grace, I did not earn it. Yeah, I've talked to, well, there's, I couldn't even begin to how many people I've talked to about Christ in the course of my life. I'm 57 years old now. I know it may be a surprise, but uh, because if you look at me, I have the youth of a 56-year-old, but I'm actually 57, and one of the things that I saw a lot of times was somebody having a real, real problem dealing with, I am not good enough. I am bad. Um, the thing is, what I call human-centric thinking, right? If you make yourself God, you make yourself the center of the universe, you are the definer of what is good and evil, guess who's always going to be good? Nobody thinks they're bad. They all think they're good, right? We all. But we are not the center of the universe. We do not get to make the rules. That's the bad news. And it's pretty hard to look at that and accept that if you haven't been introduced to that before. But people like me, the silver lining is, yeah, I still have nightmares every night, decades later, but I have no problem bowing my knee to my Lord and Savior. No problem. If there's hope for me, there's hope for every single one of you. Maybe there's somebody out there thinking, you know what, no way. I've done the unforgivable. You're not dead yet. You're not dead yet. You have not done the unforgivable. You can still turn to the Lord if you haven't. So, this song's for all of us, those who have gotten past it and can celebrate it, and those who are yet to face it and need to deal with it. It's called Prodigal. to my world, life that I have made. One day you'll repent, next day you'll receive. Yeah. 
that tonight When made the world my friend Live me high and dry I drag your name back through the mud That help us my heart and heal Now do they tell me Could your son This to be my end God. So Mike said something a moment ago that I'd like to reiterate. He said that we do our worship with an audience of one. I, that is profound, and I, I want you to know that is the truth. We are the worshipers. He is the one who is worshiped today, and reminds me of a story I heard years ago where there was a, a guy sitting in church one day, and he just did not like the music. He said, you know what, it's in the wrong key, it's the wrong tempo, I just don't like the music. And when he walked out, he saw the head usher, and he looked at the usher and said, I didn't like the music today. And the usher said, well, that's okay, it wasn't for you. <laughs> so, we are the band, and God is the audience of one. And Mike mentioned, he said, we are all the band, right? So I'll remind you, the band shows up at Sunday at 8 a.m. for rehearsal now, <laughs> so... Well, <laughs> We'll see how many show up now, right? Well, I have a confession to make this morning. It's probably one that's not going to take you by surprise, but uh, this morning as I, I was driving in, I um, had a thought, and I just wanted to share that with you. And again, it won't surprise you, but I love Sunday. I, I really do. Not because I'm a pastor. Before I went into the ministry, I loved Sunday. I loved the opportunity to learn. I liked when somebody stood up in front and opened up the scripture and taught and, and caused me to learn. I liked that. And I liked the worship. I liked being with people that, that were like-minded. And I've just always enjoyed Sunday. And that was just something that hit me this morning. I just wanted to share that with you. I don't know if well, I'm hoping you guys enjoy Sunday as well. But you know, if you're at home today, um, I just want to encourage you maybe to start thinking about coming back. We're doing some things here at Hope to try to put COVID more and more behind us as we move on. As a matter of fact, today after church, 
we're going to, and this is maybe an announcement for some of you, maybe a reminder for others, but we, we have lunch planned for you. You're going to eat lunch anyway. And so rather than going somewhere or hurrying home, just stay and enjoy. It'll, it's a free lunch. You know, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, today there is. And so we have lunch, and then there will be a movie afterwards. If you want to stay for the movie, you're welcome to. If you start the movie and think, you know, I'm not into this, you can, you can go. But stay for a while, have lunch, and just enjoy the fellowship. And so we invite you to just kind of hang out with us for a while this, this, uh, this afternoon. You know, when Jesus gathered the disciples together for communion, he said something profound. He said, I have longed to have this meal with you. He desperately wanted to share that time. Now, I'm not trying to equate what's about to happen with the life or the ministry of Jesus, but I have longed to share this, this series with you. Today, we start a new series, and I'm calling it Snapshots of Jesus. And what we're going to be doing, we're going to take different teaching moments, different events, different things in the life and the ministry of Jesus, and we're going to go through all the different Gospels and, and take some of these events and, and just expound on them. What was he doing? Why did he say what he said? Why did he do it with this, this person in mind? And, and I, I've been wanting to do this literally for years. And um, fortunately, you know, as, as Ray and I talked together, as we planned services, uh, I shared with him my idea about this, and he just said, go for it. And so it's a little bit of a break from how we typically or traditionally do uh, Sunday morning at Hope. You know, we usually take a book of the Bible and work our way through it. And when we're done with these snapshots in a month or two or three, we will get back to that. But for the next couple of months, we're going to take, again, these episodes, these events, these, these things in the life of Jesus and just try to hone down on them and try to understand them a bit better. And so we're going to start and maybe go through a little bit more chronologically as we begin. And I first started and thought about maybe doing the pre-incarnate Christ and talking about his role in creation. And I thought, nah, I'm teaching Genesis midweek and kind of doing a lot of that anyway. And so then I thought, well, I'll start with Bethlehem. And I thought, well, you know, we just did Christmas. We just did the Christmas story. And so I thought, I'll start somewhere else. So today we're going to be talking about the events immediately following what we typically think of as the Christmas message. So the events that lead up to the, the birth of Jesus are, are things that we know well. Um, we've heard the Christmas story and, and the lead up to it time and time again, probably for many of us thousands of times. So we know all about you know, the shepherds, the angelic chorus, the, the star. But what do we know about the youth of Jesus? From the time he was born until he commences his ministry, probably at about the age of 30. So what do we know about his, his formative years? You know, there's not a lot known about him in those 30 years, but there are some things that Scripture helps us to, to, to get a glimpse of, and I'm going to share some of those with you today. And Scripture, again, doesn't give us a lot of information, but what it gives us is, I think, essential for us in in understanding Jesus just a bit better. One important fact that we know that not only is he, Jesus, the law giver, but he's also one who would follow the law. And so I want to read for you in Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, where it says, And when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, and the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So in compliance with the Jewish law, Mary and Joseph and this child bring Jesus to a rabbi when he's eight days old. And it's at that eight-day ceremony where he is circumcised. And it's where other things take place in his life. Now, this was something that was instituted through Abraham about 2,000 years prior. It was a ceremony, it was a ritual, but never forget 
and I think it's good for us to be reminded of this today, it was an act of worship. And it's something that was very significant, not just in the life of Jesus, of Mary, and Joseph, but for the community as well. According to this tradition, the first seven days of a child's life, they had no identity. Now, I thought about that long and hard this last week, because I thought, why did they not give this child identity more of a significance? And then I was reading in some ancillary passages, and the infant mortality rate was high. Now, it's probably much too high even in our standards in our world today. But 2,000 years ago in a, sorry to say primitive, but that wouldn't be a fair statement, but in a, a land like Israel, the infant mortality rate was high. And maybe some of it was to guard or protect the parent's heart. But at the eighth day, the child was brought to a rabbi. If it was a boy, it was circumcised. And it was on the eighth day that the child was named. They didn't even have a name until that eighth day. Isn't that interesting? And so when they bring this child Jesus to, to the rabbi that day, Mary and Joseph name him Jesus. And that was the name that had been foretold before, as we just read, before he was even conceived. It was a name given by an angel to them nine months prior. And from that point on, Jesus would be counted as a part of the nation of Israel. And so it's significant in his life, it's significant in the life of the community. And his family line would be traced at that point, and they would know who he is a descendant of. His tribe would be very important. Who his ancestors were would be critical in knowing what his eventual standing or status in the community would be. And Jesus would be able to trace his lineage back to King David, even to Abraham itself. And so it's significant that there are these things taking place in his life as that eight-day-old baby. And so his, his history, his line would be known. It was five weeks later that Mary and Joseph traveled to Jerusalem. Because again, this is prescribed in the law how these things would be done. So five weeks later, they go to Jerusalem, they go to the temple, and in strict adherence to the Mosaic law, it is there that they would present the child to Jehovah. That circumcision, the naming, the, the things that took place, first took place in Bethlehem when he was just eight days old. They would just take him to their family rabbi, to the local guy. But when he was five months old, again, I'm thinking maybe it had something to do with the mortality rate, they wanted to make sure there was sustained life. But at the five-month period, they would bring the child, again, as prescribed by Moses, to the temple. And it was there that the mother, it tells us in Luke, would complete her purification. After birth, after the afterbirth and things that had taken place, they would wait that five-week period, and when the mother could once again enter into a house of worship, that's when things would start to unfold for the family. And so at that time, there would be a sacrifice of two turtle doves that would be sacrificed as part of this ritual. And it was at the five-month mark that the parents took on even a greater responsibility of training, of nurturing, dare I say, discipling the child. I was talking with some friends a few minutes ago. Yesterday, we got all of our grandkids together. It was fun. And there was somebody that hadn't been around our, our kids for a while, walked into the room, and our six-month-old grandson was sitting on the floor. And this adult walked in and said, my goodness, he's sitting up all by himself. <laughs> Look at what he does, he's alert. And, and I was thinking about today, and I thought, you know, there's something about when a child is five or six-month-old where they're a little bit more attuned to what's happening. And in Jewish culture, in Jewish tradition, it was at about that time that they said, there are things that we need to do in the heart and the life of this child. And that's why that five-month mark is so important. And so at this point in time, when Mary and Joseph come to the temple, they present Jesus before the Lord, they take on for themselves a greater responsibility in parenting. 
Now, it's not like they shirked their responsibilities before that. It's not like they said, oh, we don't have anything to do with this child. But in the Jewish tradition, at that five-month mark, they said, you know, it's important to us that this child learns who Jehovah God is, that this child learns to treasure God in his heart. I don't know about you, but as a parent, you start thinking about how have I instilled the love of God in in my children's heart? You see, that was something that this people, that this culture, that this tradition took seriously. And, And I think many of us need to do so as well. Maybe ramp it up just, just a bit. And so this, this, uh, commitment to, again, parenting, if you will, is critical, but there's, this is a change point in the life of Jesus. And so following this plan would be crucial, would be critical. And that's why in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 27, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a just and a devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the hope of Israel, if you will. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him, to to Simeon, through the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. God would keep him until the Messiah emerged. And so he came by spirit into the temple, and when Jesus uh, came into the temple and was brought by his parents to do so according to the custom of the law, again at this five-month mark, he, Simeon, took the boy Jesus in his arms and blessed him. Simeon's a devout man. He's a holy man. He's a righteous man. He's a godly man. He's a prophet. And God revealed to him that he would not die until until he'd seen the, the Messiah. And when Mary and Joseph enter into the temple that day, again at the five-month mark, with Jesus in their arms, Simeon knows the Messiah is in his presence. Listen to verses 28 through 32, where it says, And he took him in his arms and he blessed him. And then this is the prayer of Simeon. He said, Lord, now you are letting your servant, me, depart in in peace. I can die. You have fulfilled your promise, God. I have seen the Messiah. And so because of that, I'm free to go. He says, all of this according to your word and to your promise. For my eyes have seen salvation. Wow, I love that. Which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Simeon's recognition of Jesus that, as the Christ, it's huge, isn't it? It's significant. This is not something that Simeon just knew because he said, oh, there's something different about that that boy. God the Holy Spirit was within him, and he recognizes, he acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ. It's because of the Spirit of God resting upon him that he's able to discern and to know that. Some 30 years into the future, John the Baptist is going to have a very similar experience. When he's there baptizing people, and all of a sudden his cousin comes walking down the slope of the Jordan River, and he looks at him and he says, stop, I should be baptized by you. Who am I to, to baptize the Christ, the Messiah? And Jesus says, no, let it be as it is written. And so this recognition of Jesus as the Messiah is significant. We have, I believe, an irrefutable witness in the person, in the man Simeon. But scripture also speaks, if you will, of the need for there to be a confirmation. In the book of Deuteronomy, in Numbers, in First and Second Kings, in Zechariah, in Leviticus, in Genesis, in Proverbs, it talks about the need for a second witness for certain things. And so it's one thing for Simeon to say, well, I've seen the Messiah. But is there a second witness? Is there someone else that can attest to who Jesus is? Well, God doesn't leave things undone, does he? And so in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, 
it says, now there was this woman, Anna. She was a prophetess and a daughter of Phanuel. Of the tribe of Asher, she was great in age, and she had, she had lived with her husband for only seven years, and then became a widow. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. And for 84 years, she served in the temple with fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him all who looked upon him for redemption. And she proclaimed the Christ to all who would listen. Now, Anna's an old lady. If she was a typical Jewish woman of the day, she got married at about 13, 14 years old, very similar to Mary. She was a wife for seven years. So she was widowed at about 21 years of age. And then it says for the next 84 years, she serves in the temple. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but if you do 84 and 21, she's about 105 years old. She's an old lady. <laughs> and she sees this boy Jesus come into the temple that day. And she is that, if you will, that second witness to affirm that he is the Christ. So Luke tells us that both Simeon and Anna announced the Messiah to the people of Jerusalem. And I've got to think the people of that day are pretty similar to people today. I'm sure, and you know, others of you have told me that you've shared Christ with your friends, and they've not listened, not really given heed to your word. We try to do things to invite people to our church or to come to faith, and they say, ah, oh, you know, if that works for you, that's fine. And I think people are people. And I think the people that Simeon and Anna dealt with are very similar to the people that you and I deal with as well. The crowds ignored, quite frankly, what Simeon and what Anna made known to them. Why would they do that? Well, why do our friends do that today? I don't want to be bothered with a God in heaven. I don't want to be bothered with a new set of do's and don'ts, they think. I don't want to be bothered with, with somebody that comes in and says, they want to take lordship of my life. I don't want to be bothered with somebody who says they want to establish their throne in the kingdom of my heart. I kind of like making decisions for myself. I kind of like being in charge. And I don't like this surrender thing at all. And so the people of Jerusalem, when they rejected Simeon, when they rejected Anna, I think they're so much like our friends today. And so even though there's this affirmation that the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is, is in their presence. Quite frankly, the people of Jerusalem, they don't care. And Mary and Joseph and Jesus, they return to Bethlehem. And they continue on with their life, and they continue on with the things that they are supposed to do. And Joseph, being a good man, disciples his son, nurtures his son, teaches his son, But others are waiting and looking and hoping as well. You know, we had an interesting conversation with some guys in our midweek Bible study this last, last Wednesday night. And we talked about Jesus as a child. We talked about him as a youth. And we thought, you know, that's an interesting thought. If he is God in the flesh, you know, what kind of training did Joseph give him? When he's God, when he's created everything, when he is all powerful, all knowledge, you know, hold the hammer this way. Yeah, I know, Dad. <laughs> you know, this is how you sob. Too. I know, I know. <laughs> you know. And yet, we also know that he is an obedient, a, a, a good son. And I think that there were things about maybe dealing with other people that he learns during that time, or is exposed to, and, and there's things that he he just kind of solidifies in his thinking. But during this time, there are different events that take place, and there are people that are wondering and waiting for the emergence of the Messiah as well. And again, kind of referring to that, that Christmas story, we do know that there, was, there were some wise men, there were some scholars, there were men who were observing 
the heavens, and they were following a star. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 2 now. And in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the heavens, and we've come to worship him. Now these wise men, without the aid of telescopes, but they were men who I, I think were learned. They were, they were scholars. They were educated. They studied the stars. They studied the heavens. And, and they plotted where these different constellations, where the different stars, where the different planets were. And, and in amazement, they saw that there was something different that had taken place. Now this is not conjecture. There is evidence historically for what I'm about to share with you. And this, I think this will blow your mind. <laughs> I think. But they tell us that at about this time, both Saturn and Jupiter aligned and caused for there to be a brightness in the sky. But even more amazing to that, there is what they call an evanescent star that appeared. Now, an evanescent star is not a star, but that's what it's referred to, okay? An evanescent star. And it is probably a big bubble of gas that somehow explodes, it erupts, it burns, and it's brilliant and it's bright. But it's only for a time and then it diminishes and it goes out. An evanescent star is not something that's only happened once in world history. They happen all the time. But there was an evanescent star that appeared at the same time that there was this this gathering of Jupiter and, and Saturn together. Is that conjecture? Could this truly be what these guys witnessed? Well, we think so. There are some other learned men who studied the heavens, and they said, we think this is what happened. There's a guy that you may have heard of, Johannes Kepler. Kepler is a famous astronomer. He was a mathematician. He was a a philosopher. He is the man who, in science, plotted for us the planetary motion. Kepler is the guy that said, this is how Jupiter circulars, circles the earth. This is how Saturn, this is how... And, and so much of what we know about the heavens is from, from Kepler. Kepler said, in tracing the planets, he could go back to 4 BC and say there was an, an alignment of Jupiter and Saturn in 4 BC, and other people had written about this evanescent star, this, this burst of light in the heavens in 4 BC. And so Kepler says, we believe that to be the star of Bethlehem. Again, star, but this emergence of bright light. There's another guy by the name of Alexander von Humboldt. You ever go to Humboldt, California? Cal State Humboldt? Kind of a famous guy even in our world today. Humboldt was a polymath and a naturalist. A polymath, what's that? He studied more than one kind of man. He was like a renaissance man. If you study Humboldt's life, he was just into everything. He was like a Leonardo da Vinci. He was like a Benjamin Franklin. They say there was probably nothing that Humboldt didn't just get his mind wrapped around. Brilliant man. Humboldt said, and again, through his study of the heavens and the stars, that there was some great event in about 4 BC where he believes that Jupiter and Saturn aligned. There was an evanescent star that exploded, erupted, and he goes, I believe that to be the star of Bethlehem. Kepler and Humboldt are not Christian men. But even through this non-Christian evidence, these men, we have evidence, I believe, of what's taking place in the heavens. And both of them say that this convergence of the planets, of the stars, are the thing that we believe these wise men, these magi, these these men from the east saw. And to get a better observation point, they left their home and they tried to get to a place which happened to be at Bethlehem, where they could have a better observation of that. It intrigued them, Kepler and Humboldt, but it intrigued the magi as well. 
And they were willing to leave their homes. They believed that maybe they came from the region around the Caspian Sea. We don't know, but that's the most uh, common thinking. And that they traveled to Bethlehem to better observe this, this emergence, this, this miraculous thing in the heavens. Not only were guys like Kepler and Humboldt studying it through the years, not only were the Magi looking at it in the first century, but there was a guy named Herod that was intrigued by it as well. And when these Magi appeared in Herod's court, they asked, where is he who's been born the king of the Jews? And Herod said, wait a minute. I'm the king of the Jews. I'm not a child. There's no, no new birth here. What are you guys talking about? Oh, we've seen his star. There's a king who's been born. We've come to worship him. And Herod's frightened. Not for any other reason than for the loss of power, for the loss of his throne, for the loss of who he is. And so Herod orders his wise men to come into him and say, tell me what these, these men are searching. And so Herod's advisors, his scholars, his mathematicians, astronomers say, well, it's written in the Old Testament that there will be a child born, Malachi tells us, in Bethlehem who will be the king of the Jews. Oh, Bethlehem, you say. Part of my kingdom, you say. Herod gives a decree that all male children two years and younger are to be executed this this to be done to protect himself he does this thinking that it's a way of really preserving his throne his kingdom and in matthew chapter 2 verses 13 through 16 it says now when they the wise men had departed Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take your child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the child and his mother, and by night they departed for Egypt. And while he was there, they stayed until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled for what was spoken, that the child, this prophet, had come out of Egypt. And it is out of Egypt, God said, that I will deliver my son. You see, there was a need to follow protection for this, for this Christ child. Herod is all the vile description of humanity that you can think of. He is a horrible man. His cruelty, his depravity, really speaks for himself. Herod becomes king not because he inherited it. It was not a hereditary th throne, but out of graft and out of bribe, he becomes the king of Israel. And while he is on the throne, he marries and then has children with his wife. And he's not so happy with them. He murders his wife. He murders all of his children. Thinking that there might be someone looking for vengeance, he murders his mother-in-law, he murders his brother-in-law, he murders many within the household. As a matter of fact, it was known and historically accounted for that, that if there was anyone that displeased him, he had no, compo no hard time in, in executing people. He is known to have burned many Jewish leaders at the stake. He's a horrible man. And upon hearing of this newborn king, again, he issues this decree that all children, male to and under, in the region of Bethlehem are to be killed. And so we refer to this as the slaughter of the innocents. Killing off, really, of almost an entire prospective generation. So in a dream, Joseph is told, flee to Egypt for protection. Let me just share the first few ver words in verse 14, Matthew chapter 2. It says, When he arose, Joseph, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed. I love the instant, immediate obedience that Joseph displays. You know, if God tells Kevin, why don't you do something? 
Let me pray about it. <laughs> Let me think it over. Let me get together with my nine best friends and see if all nine of them concur with you, God. And then I'll think about it. But God speaks to Joseph and says, leave your home, flee to Egypt. He wakes up and says, we're out of here. I love that about Joseph. That's the kind of man that God the Father puts in charge of raising God the Son. Somebody who's so completely obedient. I love that. That wasn't in my notes, but that just kind of jumped off the page at me, and I wanted to share that with you. I love that about Joseph. And so he is a man who flees to Egypt for the protection of his family, and we see that in the life of Joseph, Mary, and obviously the Christ child, faith is vital, and it's vital to who we are as well. And in this earthly life, Joseph, I believe, models, as does Christ, what it means to be someone who follows faith. And so in Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, it says, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to, the, to them in a dream and said to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go back to the land of Israel, for those who sought to kill you are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and he came out of the, the land and returned to Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. He said, you know what? The dad was bad, maybe the son's bad, so I'm not going to go to Bethlehem. So it says he returned to the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled that Jesus would be referred to as a Nazarene. There are many stories, many lives, many events in the Old Testament that are pictures of Christ. You've probably heard that before. For example, Jonah in the belly of a great fish for three days. It's kind of a picture of Jesus in the tomb for three days. There are many things in the Old Testament that kind of help us to see and to understand New Testament things so that we go, oh, okay, God's kind of prepared me for that. I understand that. Let me see if this is something that might be something that God was doing as well. I think the nation of Israel quite possibly could have been a picture of what was happening with Christ. Let me just remind you of some events. There was a man by the name of Abram. He was from an incredibly wealthy family. And God speaks to him one day and says, I want you to leave the land of your fathers, leave your wealth, leave all your possessions, and go to a place where I will show you. And we see Abram being a faithful and obedient man, and he leaves the land of Ur and goes to a, a place that God would show him. He then establishes a home in what is now Judea, but there's a famine that strikes the land, and, and people are starving. But miraculously, there had been a young Jewish boy by the name of Joseph who had been transported off to Egypt and now, all of a sudden, the people of Israel are welcome to come into Egypt for protection. And they're there for 400 years. And at the end of that time, there is somebody who comes and redeems the people of Israel, calls them out of bondage, out of slavery, into freedom. And we know that to be Moses. And then they are told that there is a land that God will give them. It is a promised land. Now through events, Moses is not able to enter in, but the people are able to go into this promised land and have life. Do you see any parallels with Jesus? He is in glory. I think John chapter 13 gives us an incredible picture of this, something that I want to teach through on a, another day, but... But he is in glory. He is in heaven with perfect fellowship with his Father. He is there with the angels before him. And, and then he leaves and comes and dwells among men for a time. He establishes a home, much like Abram did in Judea, but in, in Bethlehem. But there's something of catastrophic harm that takes place. So he leaves his home and goes to, to Egypt. And he's there for a time. Israel was there for 400 years. Isn't it interesting there's a 400-year gap from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Hmm. And then, just as Moses redeemed the people Israel, Christ comes as our Redeemer. 
And he promises that there's something better that waits, that through him we can enter into a promised land, we can enter into eternal life. I think there's a beautiful imagery here of the Old Testament helping us to understand the life and the ministry of Christ himself. And when they return from Egypt, they settle in a town called Nazareth, and it is a very unimpressive, dare I say, backwater town. It's not the kind of place that was on, you know, anybody's itinerary to go and see the beauty of of Israel. It's not. I don't want to offend anybody, but Nazareth was considered to be a very second-rate, third-rate, fourth-rate community. It's almost like saying, you know, somebody is kind of a hick. They're from... And again, I don't want to offend anybody, but like, you know, the Ozarks, you know, they're kind of a backwater, kind of a hick kind of guy. And, and Nazareth just had that kind of reputation. It's, it's a place that nothing good really ever came from. As a matter of fact, when Philip encounters Jesus, and he's so excited, he runs and tells Nathaniel, he says, come and meet this Jesus. He's this guy from Nazareth. And and Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, they just didn't expect that. But it was a fulfillment of scripture. And we see in Isaiah chapter 53 that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. And so we see prophecy miraculously fulfilled. Jesus is raised in a wholesome, God-fearing, humble family. But Nazareth would probably not be the place that a humble, God-fearing family would choose to raise a young boy. It was a backwater community. It was Hicksville. But it was also a place known for incredibly low morals, for sin, for corruption. Nazareth was the last major city that, that people on the trade route would go to before they would go to Jerusalem. And so there are people from all over the world coming through Nazareth just prior to going into Jerusalem. And pagans, heathens, people non-Jewish that didn't want to be in proximity to the temple, to the priests, to godly lifestyle, they would stay in Nazareth. And so Nazareth was known for the place that prostitutes stayed. It was known as the place where there were opium dens. It was known for a place where there was corruption. It's not the kind of place you would raise a young boy. But God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to his people. And Jesus, during this time, he, he works with his father, Joseph. He learns a trade. He is a carpenter, and he is heavily involved in the community. And it is in this setting that he follows his family. Back in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We see that Jesus is a young boy. And Philippians chapter 2 tells us he is completely 100% human. And that's necessary with that sacrifice that would come on Calvary's cross, that it be flesh and blood that would be sacrificed. But Philippians 2 also tells us that he is completely, 100% God. And that's important as well, you see, because there's nothing human that would be acceptable as the sacrifice. And so he is completely human, completely God. Theologians refer to that as the hypostatic union. You don't have to remember that, but he is complete humanity. He is complete deity. And being part of this family, he's a blessing to others. He's, he's in a very unique setting. Now, this is not in Scripture, but I was reading one commentary this week, and they were trying to help us to understand the life of Jesus. And they said, you know, as a young 12, 13, 15, 16-year-old boy, he probably hung out with the other boys in his, his community and probably running out in the hills and just, just having a great time. And they said, but Jesus, loving his mom and his dad the way he did It would be very typical, again, not biblical, but I I think this is true. Probably saw a bunch of wildflowers and picked them and brought them home to his mom one day. Don't you see him doing that kind of thing? I do. 
They said not only did he care for his mom, but he cared for his dad as well. His dad was a carpenter. He's out in the hills with his friends, and he, he sees maybe a, a, a burl piece of wood or a, a limb that's fallen off. He says, you know, I, I bet your dad could make something really cool out of this. And he picks it up, and he lugs it home. And he says, Dad, look at this wood I found. Isn't this cool? He's always thinking of ways to serve and to care for his family. Now, again, I, it's not in Scripture, but boy, I believe that. And that's very easy for me to believe about Jesus. But not only did he care about his earthly parents, he cared, cared about his earthly, or excuse me, his heavenly parent as well. In Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 49, a little bit longer of a passage, but listen to this. It says, So when they had performed all these things according to the law, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God rested upon him. Verse 41, Then his parents went to Jerusalem, as they did every year for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom for the feast. When they found, excuse me, when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, And Joseph and his mother Mary did not know it. But supposing him to have been in company and probably part of the caravan returning home, they went a day's journey and saw him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when they, Mary and Joseph, saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I sought you anxiously. He said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? They didn't understand at the time the words that he had spoken to them. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem probably at least 12, maybe more times. They went there annually, it tells us, as was their custom. But in Jewish law, it was not until a boy was 12 years old could he go into the temple. Now, if you've studied Judaism at all, you know that even today, boys that are 12 or 13 go through what they call a bar mitzvah. It's when they, ta-da, all of a sudden they become a man, right? Now, you could, as a 12-year-old, go into the temple before that process because it was considered to be part of the training to get you ready for that. But it was not until you were 12 that you could go in. So at his very first opportunity, Jesus goes into the temple. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way before, Because again, he'd gone there year after year after year. But this is the first time he's allowed to go into the temple ground, the temple compound. And it's during this time that we see things that happen in the life of Jesus. A 12-year-old boy who had gone into the temple, from that point on in his life, he is referred to, even if you're Simeon's age, if you're 100 years plus, You're referred to as a son of the law. And so it's at this moment that Jesus is referred to and has the right to be called a son of the law in the nation of Israel. On this particular journey, on this pilgrimage, at this Passover, people not just from Israel but really all over the world came to Jerusalem. Passover was a big deal. It's like Christmas, Easter, and St. Patrick's Day all in one, you know. I don't know why I picked on St. Patrick's Day, probably because I'm Irish, but it's just a big deal. And so people from, from Greece, from Turkey, from the Arabic states, from surrounding regions, they all came to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so it's not just the temple priests that are sitting there on the southern steps with them one day, but it's probably some of the most educated men in the known world from Greece, from Turkey, again, from all over, that are sitting there with Jesus. And he's listening to them, and he's posing questions, and he's giving answers to them. And they're saying, my goodness, this is a bright young boy. 
He's a protege. And they're probably thinking, I don't think some backwater rabbi from Nazareth did this, you know? He has answers. He's got a profound depth to him. Jesus amazed the scholars. He amazed the priests. We see him in just a very short glimpse, in a, as I like to call a snapshot of his life. And we see this progression taking place over the time. And for some reason, the gospel writers, as inspired by God the Holy Spirit, for the next 18 years, there's a gap. There's silence. We really don't know anything about his life, his community, his family. But we do know that he is faithful in his preparation and in his waiting on the Lord. As I thought about that, and I've talked to some of you about different things in your life. Sometimes waiting is hard, isn't it? Waiting for a, we sang that song, Prodigal, a few minutes ago. Waiting for that prodigal to come home. That's hard. That's a hard wait. There's some health issue or a financial issue or a relational issue that you, you need God to intervene. And from the time you've asked and until he acts, that waiting time is hard. It's hard. Many of you, I, I would dare to say probably all of you, have been in God's waiting room at, at some time. I've been there, and it's hard. But there are things that God does when we're in the waiting room that he can do best then than at any other time. You see, when we're in the thick of the battle, when we're in the throes of what, what we're going through, sometimes it's hard to take it all in, to process it, and to say, this is why this is happening. I understand this now. And because of just a hectic pace and, and what we're going through, sometimes we can't discern that. I had that very conversation with somebody here at our church about two weeks ago, and they were going through chaos. And he looked at me and said, Kevin, I don't know what God's trying to teach me in this. And I said, don't worry. It may not be time to learn the lesson. It's just time to trust right now. I believe that in time, I said maybe in a week, a month, maybe a year, maybe further down the road than that, you'll know why you went through this. You'll know what you were to learn. And God will do that and help us to see his, his, as Georgia says, and I love this, his fingerprints upon your life. Now, God can make some of the teaching known to us, certainly. We can understand maybe why we're going through some of that, but sometimes, again, it's not until after the fact. And the thing for us to do is to learn to trust. I remind you of Joseph. He didn't know why he had to go to Egypt. He didn't know what Herod's decree was. He didn't know about this innocent slaughter of the innocents that was about to take place. All he knew was, get out of here. And his immediate response was to, to go. I was in an interesting conversation with a pastor from Africa. He said, you want to know the difference in the American church and the African church? And I said, yeah. He said, the American church likes to process things. He says, we like to learn things. And so he says, in the American church, you don't feel like you're qualified to teach a Sunday school class till you've been in church for 10 years. You don't feel like you're qualified to be a pastor till you've gone to college and you have this degree or you've done this. He goes, but in the African church, when we read something and it says do it, we do it. <laughs> he says, we don't have to process it. He goes, we're obedient. And I said, you know, I would much rather be in an African church. Because there's something about being obedient to the word of God. When he says, do this, be this, think this, do it. And so it's during that waiting process, I think oftentimes that God grabs a hold of our heart, forms us and shapes us into the people he, he wants us to be. It's what I want in my life. It's what I want for each of us. Sometimes during that waiting process, it's hard but it's then that God develops a trust in us that he can use for our lifetime. 
we trust him in even the way that we approach him on, on days like this. There's something that he has promised to do, and that is to, to redeem us. Just like he redeemed Israel out of Egypt, just like he redeemed Mary, Joseph, and Jesus out of Egypt, just like he's redeemed us out of the, the wilderness of our lives as well. And he wants us to remember what we've done for what he has done for us. And one way that he helps us to remember is through communion. In Luke, excuse me, not Luke, but in Acts chapter 2, it says of the early church that every soul would submit to the Lord and that now all who believe gathered together and they had all things in common. They sold their possessions, their goods. They divided it up among the family. And they continued day to day in one accord, going from the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. That breaking of bread does mean a meal. And so again, you're invited to stay and have a meal with us after church today. But that breaking of bread also means that we remember the body that was broken, the blood that was shed for us. And it says the first century church did that continuously. And so today we have the opportunity to be so much like that first century church and to be reminded of a life that was given for us that we might have life. And so I invite you now to take this small piece of bread and to hold it in your hand and be reminded of the body that was broken for you and that you would partake now of this bread that reminds us of the body of Christ. And God bless you as you partake. And we partake now of the cup that reminds us of his shed blood poured out for the remission of sin. And God bless you as you partake now of the cup. And during this next song, if you want to partake in your own time, you're welcome and invited to do so. But Lord, we commit our hearts anew and afresh to you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. We celebrate, we thank you for what he has done for each of us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
We got one more song for you guys. Again, join in however you're inclined to in your spirit this morning, or just internally, externally, both, whatever you, whatever you feel. This is, a little, this is one we do a lot. It's called "On Our Side." Just kick it in, guys. Yeah. 
Well, it has been so good to have you here at Hope with us today, trusting that God has spoken to your heart and lifted you. Uh, again, we have lunch after church today. No need to rush off. Um, I don't think it's raining anyway, but stay and have lunch. And if you're wanting to, stay and enjoy the movie with us this afternoon. Uh, this Wednesday, our Bible studies are all meeting. The youth will be here at 6.30. We have our men and women Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And then Thursday night, we're continuing on with our study of Genesis. That is on Zoom. If you're interested in that at all, just contact me. I'll give you the ID and the password number, and you can be part of that. And I'm expecting to see all of you next Sunday at 8 a.m. for the band rehearsal. So, <laughs> but, have a, <laughs> but have a great week in the Lord. And let's, let's pray for our lunch now and say grace, and then we'll be ready for that. Okay, Father, thanks for today. Thank you for meeting us where we are. And, and we love you so. It is such a joy to be your child and to be in your, ho- your house today. In a few moments, we will partake, and we thank you, God, for your privilege, the privilege of um, partaking of your blessing, the things that you've provided for us. So use the food to strengthen and nourish. Use the conversation to edify and build up, and use the fellowship, Lord, to be good for our heart. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. God bless.